Good morning and welcome to the Pittsburgh Current Podcast. I'm Pittsburgh Current Publisher and Editor Charlie Deitch. Uh, we have today on our show, we have Allegheny County Controller Chelsea Wagner. Uh, which we all know, uh, Tuesday is the big midterm election. And while she's not running for anything, she's here to talk to us about the, uh, the Children's Fund referendum. Uh, Chelsea, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Before we start talking about the Children's Fund, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the tragedy that happened this past Saturday at Tree of Life. Um, just as a matter of background, where, where were you when you heard about what happened and what was the... Um, I was actually, we're sitting here in Beachview today, so I was coming from the 5K race mm, here right. at Hell on Hills in Beachview, um, and I was trying to do a quick Costco run. So I yeah. was down at the waterfront in Homestead, um, and received my one son was practicing football at Mellon Field mm -hmm. where Risenstein used to be yes. across from Bakery Square. So um, the first I really heard was getting a call that the kids were being asked to shelter because they didn't know what was going on. Right. Um, so, I mean, I just have to say I, how, you know, my heart goes out, particularly to the families that are families and friends most yeah. directly affected. I mean, it's just an awful, awful yeah, unthinkable thing for the whole community. And we're 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 obviously now we're several days removed, and the week has obviously gone from shock, mourning, grief, and then everyone sort of um, pulled together uh, the other day when the president came to town. Um, what personally, your thoughts on that? Do you think it was um, think it was inappropriate for the president to come to come to the city on that day? Well, I've. Um certainly been among the group of people who really disagree with a lot of the rhetoric that mm -hmm. the president uses and I believe that by failing to just denounce yeah. white supremacy mm -hmm. um, and uh, lots of other anti-immigrant language that he uses that um, there's an effect of that so I did not agree with him coming um, though I chose not to join the protest because, um, you know, just to me personally, I wanted to see the focus on right. the the funerals right. and um, the victims. And it's tough to know, I think, when to draw the line on, you know, right. ordinarily that's probably something if the president was coming to town, that might be something that you might at least pay attention or be involved in. But it's, right. it's really when you're trying to sort of, you know, walk that thin line between at what point do you uh, sort of get back to the whole um, the world of politics and and this obviously I think that this was politicized a bit from you know very early on in the early days right. um from I mean you're you're you've been in um you've been in uh, elected office for for quite a while now um do you are you seeing now are you seeing the shifts kind of go back toward the November 6th elections are you seeing a shift back I mean obviously not away from the tree of life but um I know that several candidates suspended their campaigns on Saturday and Sunday um but from what you're seeing, are you seeing some uh, return to campaigning, or is it going to make a difference as we come down? You know, I think it's hard to say. I think it's different in different regions. Mm -hmm. um, I My kids go to school in Squirrel Hill. We mm -hmm. live in the adjacent community. So um, I know for all of the people around there, it's really not back to normal. Right. I mean, it, people were saying even last night with Halloween, they saw far fewer kids trick-or-treating. Yeah. I mean, so I think that – community of Squirrel Hill and nearby it doesn't seem normal even with the elections approaching I think you know maybe a little bit further away you might now get a little bit more attention focused yeah. on the upcoming election and, and just finally on this topic there you know there's um, these things unfortunately they happen a lot across the country um, do you think there's something about Pittsburgh's resiliency because I, I did an interview out of with a TV station out of Washington DC the other night and they talked about how they thought Pittsburgh was handling this with a certain level of gravitas, I think. And they weren't sort of, you know, they were really like the, the amount of it, just everyone coming together is sort of an outpouring. Do you think that the, our resiliency as a city has something to do with how we react in situations in times like this? You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of friends about mm -hmm. this, and I think that we, we know how close-knit this community yeah. is. Um, and so in Pittsburgh, you feel like everyone is just one degree of separation. Right. And I know for many of my Jewish friends, you know, they make the point that within the Pittsburgh Jewish community, it's even closer yes. than that. Yeah. Um, and so I think it has a lot to do with that, that, you know, 
I was with other parents last night for Halloween, and one was from the George from Georgia outside mm-hmm. of Atlanta, and she was saying it's so different here. It, you didn't feel close to people, right? Um, where she lived, no discredit to that region. Sure, but, sure. But it's a different thing that we all yeah. know that tight knit community. That if you're walking down the street, you're saying hello to someone, um, and I think that really lends itself to yeah. that feeling of resiliency. Great. So. Moving on, as I think we all are, are moving on to, to the November 6th election. I mean, we're all aware of the high profile candidates um, that are running the state races and, and the national races as well. Um, but there is a referendum. There is a ballot issue uh, that Allegheny County voters will face. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, the Children's Fund. Uh, I think it was announced earlier this year, but in the spring, I believe. Um, and at that time, you urged caution and let's see how this is going to work out, play out, and they were just sort of in their beginning stages of this. Talk to me about how you sort of, the Children's Fund referendum, got on your radar and, you know, sort of your process in analyzing this as we've come to now to Election Day. Sure. So, like you said, in the spring, um, I, like just about any of the other voters, learned from, learned about this from their media launch. Mm -hmm. And frankly, back then and still sitting here today, that strikes me as a bit odd because I've been very, very involved in this whole space of early childhood education um, and some of the board positions that I've held over the years. And just as a matter of policy from the state house, I was on the education committee. Mm -hmm. And so I always stayed involved um, and a lot of education-related initiatives. So it was odd that that was the first time as county controller for a measure that is being right. um, asked of county residents to vote on and actually includes a provision about my very office. It was very odd right. for that to be the first time I heard of it. Um, I've spoken to the um, organizers of the campaign and um, – you know, I didn't take any kind of hardship from this. It wasn't personal sure. to me, but I do think they acknowledged that it was a mistake they made not going around to elected officials at least. But to me, it's the point that the general community wasn't engaged. Um, and I think that was really a critical error because I think had the general community been engaged, we could have ensured that some of these pieces that – give me so much doubt in Mm -hmm. this legislation, we're short up. And for example, I'm not confident that this money is in fact going to go to kids or that um, 90 cents on the dollar will go to kids. What makes you worry about that? Just the fact that there's no public oversight or well the the it sounds good in theory sure. so what the organizers claim is that this is um, accountability and that the county government will oversee it well as controller I can tell you for the last seven years I've looked at many similar funds and I can tell you they're not um, there really is an oversight. The best example I can give is the Clean Air Fund. Right. Um, and right. this has been something that has been in the news recently because you have a lawsuit from some of the um, environmental advocates against the county for mis- really mismanagement, what I right. would refer to as mismanagement of that fund. Um, that fund specifically by the legislation is to help remediate the impact of bad air quality. Right. Um, it comes from fines on um, polluters, basically. Sure. But you have, in this instance, $5 million from that fund and another $5 million from another fund. Instead of going to kids in Clareton, Braddock, and the other communities that are most impacted by bad air quality, right. uh, it's going to rebuild offices. And that's that type of um, kind of maneuvering that you can see when there is lack of specificity and accountability within the very letter of the law. And so that's what's missed in this legislation. Yeah. And I think it's maybe it's not an exact example, but I think when you look back at the city of Pittsburgh's uh, police review board, while um, very important and it was a big fight at the time to get that, there wasn't that precise power built into that referendum it relied on uh, city council, and which obviously then it relies on negotiation to decide, okay, how is this going to operate? So, again, you're voting for something now that you don't know what the controls are going to be once it— Right. And, and maybe in other areas of the country, yeah. you've had good outcomes with this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I think here, and you gave that example of the police review board, I think there are a lot of different examples— 
Uh, and I think it's particularly troubling when you're talking about a tax. Yeah. And I don't think we should take that lightly. Um, I would stand here and or sit here and um, argue for tax dollars to go to kids, and I'd be happy to go and make that case to every resident. Mm -hmm. um, this is compared to the library tax. I was an advocate for the library tax because I knew that it was going to go and keep those libraries open, which right. it did very specifically. Um, I can't say the same thing. So I can't say to seniors on this tax that, yes, this I absolutely would say, yes, this is a worthy right. cause, but I can't say to them, if you're going to be taxed an extra $25 a year, that that's going to go to the kids. I, right. I just can't say that from my you know perspective as controller where I've seen mismanagement over the years. And there are a lot of other examples of that. Right. And one thing, I mean, obviously, um, the money, we should say the money would be the 25, would it be extra onto your property taxes, which again, property taxes are, are a big issue for a lot of people who, um, you know, maybe feel like, you know, when this, you know, every year they're waiting to see what the schools are going to come and take out. So property taxes and property tax reform has been something that, you know, at least our state legislature has talked about working on. So it's an important issue now to say we're going to go back to the property tax. And I, again, I assume you don't know if that was something they, that they did a study and they, they came to that or was it, but again, you would think that there were certainly stakeholders like yourself and others in county government uh, or city government that would be at the table to figure out what's the best way to tax this even. Right, right. Well, and I think even before you get there, yeah, I would argue that there are budgets or priorities and never did we look within county government. Um, you know, our human services budget is a really massive budget. I can tell you there are some very big chunks of that budget that are outsourced um, to, you know, one is to Deloitte for the different computer mm -hmm. Um, type services. One is to uh, an organization called Great Lakes that does a lot of the staffing. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm looking at this, I would say in those areas where we have a surplus within our budget, there are lots of different areas. And this is the other big part that concerns me um, and I think is really a fatal flaw. The organizers never came through the normal course of right. the county um, budgeting process, which is the transparent and democratic right. process. So they should have been at the budget hearings last year or the year before saying, can you please find this money for these three different aims within county budget? And then if they were told no, right. I think then this referendum is the right. right thing to do. But I don't, to your point on how they got to a property tax, I really don't know. I remember this from the library. Right. Um, and the reason the library tax did that was because it is within specific state legislation right. that provides for mm -hmm. that within the library code. But here, I really have no idea. And um, something you said made me think of a question. Um, the Oh, the t we're talking about due diligence and due process. Even they didn't come to county government, which is step one. But if they had, of course, it would have gone through complete hearing process. But you would think if this is something, if you're asking for tax dollars, there should have been some kind of public process. And there was no public process or a limited public process? No, no. Yeah. And I think that's the real kind of juxtaposition because you have this massive, I would argue, unprecedented campaign to get people to vote yes, but they completely bypass, bypass the part where there would have been public hearings and public input. Um, and I think that's yeah. that's not how democracy works. Right. And I think it's particularly concerning in this area um, in Pittsburgh, Allegheny County. Um, I think we have to do a lot better. And so I, I would be a person that would say yes, more tax dollars to go to kids and to programming, but I think we're doing all of these causes a major, major disservice um, by you know not really doing the due diligence, right. not having a transparent process. You know, I look in recent days, how are we spending all this money to fight transparency on Amazon? Right. Um, but right. then you have these programs here that can't get funding in our regular process. I mean, there's something that's really amiss, and I think voters on the right and the left right. have a reason to be frustrated. Right. You are watching and will be listening to the Pittsburgh Current Podcast, coming to you from the heart of Beachview at Sorgatron Media. Uh, you can follow us on our socials at, at PGH Current.
um, and we're talking to Allegheny County Controller Chelsea Wagner about the Children's Fund. Um, do you worry that that this could be that this could set a a bad precedent of how we're now going to do things? If this were to get passed, I mean, what would stop another nonprofit agency or something to say they wanted money for for whatever for for stadiums or prove anything like that to come forward and say, okay, we're just going to put this forward and we're going to say what it's for, but there really hasn't been a process for people to make sure that that's what it's for. Right. I, I do. That is a very, yeah. very big concern. And I give the example of, you know, if you're a millionaire or billionaire, you could run a campaign, you know, basically pulling the wool over the eyes right. of voters. And I think what's particularly concerning also here is it's like everyone has a gun to their heads. Right. And I don't think this has to be the end game. I told the organizers that um, I would be happy to help come back to yeah. this and do this the right way. Um, and I really mean that. But I think it's the unfortunate thing is we're in the 11th hour. We're right on the eve of the election. And people have really serious questions about this. Mm -hmm. I do my best to answer them, but there are many yeah. answers I can't provide. Right. Um, and so it's a false choice. So we're being said, are you for the kids or not? And <laughs> right. I, I think that's just right. really unfortunate. What, what, what is the, um, and not the alternative necessarily, not that we, there's an alternative to this necessarily, but, but what is the answer to that question about um, funding for preschool and after school programs? I mean, obviously, we, we've tried at the state level, we've tried at the local level. So is it eventually maybe something like this in some form, or what, what is the answer? I, I do think it would be very appropriate for us to be looking at it countywide mm -hmm. um, because I think that, you know, it is something that, is um you know we see people have being pushed out of the city frankly you know this is something that impacts all of us um whether somebody is more affluent mm -hmm. or whether they don't have those means and i i'm a huge believer and the data shows this that right. investments and early childhood education are some of the best investments that you can make from an economic standpoint um, so I would like to see this, and I think it would really be appropriate for the Pittsburgh region that is this um, center place for tech and mm -hmm. kind of new economies. This would be one of the best things that we can do, but we need to make sure it's going there. So you have three different stated objectives mm -hmm. um, from this fund, but it's they're loosely defined. So it isn't right. that money would just go to this, but it's nutritious meals, after school programs, and pre-K education. However, you and I as voters are given no real outcome-based information. Right. So as this is written right now, it could not even begin to put a dent in any of those programs. Right. Um, but we should know that. We should know if we're going to be doing a quarter mil increase, right. what is it going to address and what can we expect? I mean, kind of like a secured... Um, transaction. I think there's no security here for the investment. Yeah. Let's go. Let's talk about the other side of this. If this is approved, what do you do? I mean, what do you, what is the, what is the first, I mean, is it, I, it, it's again, you said it falls to your office in some way, shape or form, but then would there have to be some sort of specific law crafted after the fact or, or what would happen if, if this were to be passed? Well, um, if this were to be passed, you have, I think, a um, it, it calls for, if you read the legislation, mm -hmm. um, a um, almost like a, a board. I compare yeah. it to an authority board, yeah. which also right. is the <laughs> part similar concerning, though, because right. it would be housed within county government, um, it would be within the jurisdiction of my office to do audits, not just financial audits, but also performance audits. Right. Um, but I can tell you like those other examples that doesn't necessarily have teeth. So right. just like the clean air fund, um, we've looked very specifically at that clean air fund, but if you don't have a county council or a county executive that are going to legislate on that, yeah. then it doesn't really matter. And I think talking about this from, um, be a, the organizers say that, this is um, a good government process because you have county oversight. Um, I think we have to admit that our form of government is really flawed. Right. Um, it has, it's still very, very new. Um, and I hope that it gains strength. I'd like right. to see a more active legislative branch, but it's really set up to be a very, very strong executive system right. 
with very few checks and balances at the legislative level. And I think that gets to why right. these types of measures are particularly dangerous. Right. Do you think that, again, do you think it, um, because of what you just said, because there is, and we've all, we've all talked about, you know, whether it's by choice or by design, the Allegheny County Council has certainly been called a rubber stamp yeah. for the chief executive. Now that, again, whether that's because they're limited in their power or they've decided to, that that's how they want to operate. Do you think that something like this that could come out of a frustration by people who just are maybe, maybe they see things like the clean air fund and other things like that. And they're so they're like, well, so how do we, if we don't take the bull by the horns, how are we going to, to do something? And as you admit, potentially if this was done the right way beforehand, potentially this could be something that you'd be sitting here with a completely other opinion on. Yeah. And many of these groups, um, yeah. I have a lot of respect for their mm -hmm. work. So I, I, I actually, I do feel for them in yeah. the position that they're in because I think they were really misled in terms of how to go about this process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's um, just unfortunate because you look at groups like Trying Together, uh, formerly Pacey, that does yes. all of the work mm -hmm. in the early education space. Um, they do tremendous, tremendous work. Yeah. Um, but I think coming into this kind of legislative um, government process, they were not advised well, you know, so a group that is really community based right. didn't involve the community. Um, so and that's where I think this can't be the end game. I right. think that if this is passed, I'll certainly work with all of them to do my best <laughs> right. to help put some yeah. sort of measures in place, because I know they want to see right. this money going to kids and not administrative costs. Um, but if it is not passed, like I said, I've offered my assistance to try to come back and really do it the right way. Right. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you can you can build you can build the referendum. You can build the law like what you're voting on could be that 90 cents on the dollar goes toward programs. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that's it's that right. simple is that it could have been done. I think that's the part yeah. that's really important. That's the teeth. Yeah. You know, this really has to have teeth in it right. to make sure. Another example, if people think of this from uh, let's see, this was probably about 2008 when the county did the drink tax and yeah. car rental tax. Yeah. Um, that was something that concerned me at the time. And in hindsight, it's something that um, I believe my concerns were validated by because <laughs> sure. you had, um, I watched those county council hearings where you had transit advocates mm -hmm. with really um, severe needs being used as pawns, I would say, yeah. because they came to those meetings and said, we need this to fund transit. What the county instead did was took the $25 million they had already given to transit mm -hmm. out. So right. there was no, it was like this gun to the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it never benefited transit. You right. know, the county was actually doing a disservice to transit. Right. Um, and so tra the transit investment has been no better in that fund. Yeah. There's a big surplus in that. And I've argued in recent years, why aren't we using that right. to put into expanding service to many of these communities that yeah. have been cut off and don't have enough? And that's a great example because a lot of people felt bamboozled into, I mean, we did countless <laughs> stories on people that were, when they when they realized that this wasn't going to be an additional 25, we, we weren't going to have 50 million toward transit. It was the same 25. Now the county had 25 to go elsewhere with or, or you know to spend elsewhere and so i know that that's 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 a great that's a great example of what can happen when th when you know there's not a real check and balance on on what's going on so right. what would be switching this to um uh the the makeup i mean other than other than uh uh, uh trying to get a, a change to the to the charter correct i mean there's no way to fix the current situation right you would say no no and, and even within this there's no repeal there's yeah. no potential to repeal this as it is written as mm -hmm. i understand it yeah. as our the lawyers in our yeah. office have looked at this um and there's no sunset to it it doesn't no and and require, these are some of the problems yeah. that you've actually seen with the drink tax and car rental tax um yeah. You know, those have actually gone back to county council and have been lowered. Right. Um, because likewise, there were really no studies. It right. was just a number out of the yeah. air. Um, and I think there there are some details. When I sat down with the organizers of this campaign, um, they did provide some answers. And one of the um, analysts in my office was in a meeting and she said, tell me about the history. How did you get mm -hmm. here? And she told them, she said, that should be on your website. You should be talking to everyone yeah. about how this went from this idea 
um, at, from the state level and beyond, yeah. um, because that's the information I think voters do need to know. Right. Um, so just sort of, um, just kind of, I guess, wrapping up, putting, putting, putting a bit of a, a lid on this, I guess. Um, I can tell sort of that it's just really a struggle for you to say, don't vote for something like this. Because again, as you've said, that's been a huge focus of yours as, as a legislator, but also as, as a mother, that's something that, that comes through loud and clear to you. Yeah. Um, so as you said, this is, you don't see this as the end game. So if, if this, if this fails on Tuesday, will you actively try and figure out how to get something up for, you know, possibly spring election or something like that or something, you know, even next fall, is this something that you plan to actively work with them yeah, on? If I, I would love to. And I really think that the first part of that should be looking within our budget yeah. as it is. Um, because I do think there is room. It's That's not an easy thing. Right. But, I mean, that's really what governing is right. about. Um, I know our costs in government continue to rise, just like every organization. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is on the health care side. But I just think we have to have honest conversations. Yeah. Um, whether it's about how we fund kids programming or yeah. how we fund county government. Um, because I think that's, that's fair. And I think people would be pleasantly surprised. I do think voters would support <laughs> yes, that yeah. sort of thing, just like they did on the library tax because yeah, they didn't I, want their libraries to close. Right. And a lot of people, I think they weren't sure if the library tax was going to come through, but it, it did because as you right. said, that's something that people decided that was worth coming out of their, coming out, coming out of their property taxes for. Right. Um, we are, I've been talking with Allegheny County controller, Chelsea Wagner here on the Pittsburgh current podcast. Chelsea, as the year wraps as the year wraps up and the new year begins, what is your office working on in terms of, uh, I know you guys are always looking, doing audits and looking, what are you guys working on currently? Well, one of the big ones is looking at the plans at the airport. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that all County taxpayers should be watching. Uh, the airport is about to embark on a two billion plus dollar renovation, right? Um, and and we're concerned about that because this coming year is actually the year that the airport comes out of debt. So from my perspective, it seems like right. this is the year where we really should be able to lower those gate fees, right? Um, so there's a lot of complexity around this, um, and this is what we've been spending quite a bit of time looking into, right? And there are, I mean, there are several terminals gates that that are barely if being used at all because of the loss of traffic over the years at the airport so yeah it seems to be you know an uh, maybe at least potentially an odd investment um at this time anyway yeah and it's you know we we do have an airport i think that is designed very well i rely on other people that yeah, know yeah. a lot more mm -hmm. about this industry than i do um somebody made the point to me recently that i thought was really interesting that we are a really attractive city mm -hmm. um, to fly in and out of because we have more stable weather. Um, so there are a lot of different things that um, I think we can do. I mean, the flip side of this one is I see how we are an airport that was built pre 9-11. Right. So it is correct that airports that have general um, non-passenger access to their concessions mm -hmm. that that's where a lot of money can come from but i think this doesn't have to be right. kind of a one-size-fits-all i think there are ways to do it um without a massive massive price tag because even though um that's not taxpayer per se right that still comes back to me and you you know it's still coming back to what it costs us to take a flight to Philadelphia or New York, right. where if we were in another city, you know, we could do that um, at a far cheaper cost. Absolutely. Allegheny County Controller Chelsea Wagner, thank you for joining us today. And uh, the controller has written uh, an op-ed, which you can read on pittsburghcurrent.com within the next half hour or so. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your contribution. Thank you for coming in today. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, and congratulations on all the work. You're thank doing. you so much. Uh, just one announcement: if you want to celebrate or commiserate your the fate of your favorite candidates on Tuesday, the uh, Pittsburgh Current and the Incline are hosting a election watch party at eight starting at eight o'clock at local on Carson Street. Uh, there will be food, drinks, and you can come down. Uh, the Pittsburgh Current and the Incline will have. Uh, our newsroom set up. You can talk. You can talk with us and kind of see how we do our job. And uh, Sorgatron Media will be there with us and we'll be providing updates throughout the night. So that is November 6th, starting at 8 o'clock at Local on the South Side. And this has been the Pittsburgh Current Podcast. Uh, we'll see what kind of world we're living in next week. See you then.